Okay, remember there are three factors that we always have to trade off in a communication system. There's bid error rate versus SNR, there's cost, and then there's something called spectral efficiency. And spectral efficiency is what we're going to start focusing on now. Now when I start to talk to you about spectral efficiency, I'd like to get the concept out there about uh, spacing of signals. And the most difficult uh, concept to, to master in this case is for FSK. So frequency shift keying places symbols on different frequencies. So if I want to be spectrally efficient, I don't want to spread out those frequencies over an enormous range. I would like to make them as compact as possible so that I don't use up more spectrum than I have to. So we're going to get this idea of using as little spectrum as we can. We're going to do it first with FSK, and then we're going to look at PSK and QAM. So let's start with uh, the basic idea of you know, what, what impacts how tightly I can space FSK. So spectral efficiency is covered in the chapter 9 of our reference uh, text. So let's recall what, what are, were our defining features of frequency shift keying. Of course, it's an orthogonal modulation format. Each one of the symbols is a different frequency. And the basis vectors are pretty much the symbol vectors because it's an orthogonal modulation already. That means that each one of these cosines is supposed to be uh, orthogonal to one another. That was our assumption, right? I said the basis vectors were just the symbols because the symbols were orthogonal. Orthogonal, so I'm saying that this cosine of omega i, cosine of omega j, when I do the inner product of these, that I should get a zero whenever i is not equal to j. So before, when I did my analysis for non-coherent detection, for example, I said I assumed there was noise only and no signal. And, uh, excuse me, in the coherent detection, I said um, each one of the branches when I did coherent detection that there would be noise alone without a signal. And actually, that is because of this orthogonality. And I'll get to the, the, the non-coherent case as a special case. So how is it that we assure this uh, uh, orthogonality? How can I choose these two frequencies, omega i and omega j, to make sure that they really are orthogonal to one another. Again, if I make them really far apart, maybe that'd be easy, but I want to bring them together, and I want to know how tightly, how closely can I bring them and still respect this orthogonality. So I'm going to take um, the inner product. This is the inner product of frequency one and frequency two, and I'm going to see what does it take to make this zero to make them orthogonal. What are the criteria on F1 and F2 that I can ensure that this will always give a zero? Now, you'll notice here I introduced a theta. I introduced a phase. And that's because I want to do one mathematical development which will apply to non-coherent detection just as well as it would to coherent. So in the coherent, I have m branches. Each one of the branches, I have a PLL, a uh, phase-like loop, and I track the, the the phase, in which case this would be like a zero. And I have another solution, which is not coherent, where I have a branch and each one is a filter, and I just filter out the other ones, in which case, uh, you know, there is some phase that I don't know. And if I want them to be orthogonal, uh, if I want to really have in one filter only noise and not the, the other um, component, then I have to uh, respect this relationship. So here is the uh, uh, equation for the inner product. So the first thing I do in this equation is I have this term which has got the phase in it of theta. So what I do is I say this is cosine of alpha plus beta, you know, it's a sum, a cosine of a sum of two terms, which I can write as a cosine times a cosine plus or minus a sine times a sine. So one of the arguments was the theta uh, and one was the f1 of t. Now, because the theta is not a function of time, then those cosines of theta and the sine of theta, they just move outside of the integral. Clear? So the only thing I did here, I uh, wrote this as cosine cosine minus sine sine, uh, separated them out into the cosine cosine minus the sine sine, and then the terms that were in theta, I move outside of the integral. Okay. 
Now, time to move on on the development. And now, what I'm going to focus on is the fact that here, I have a product of a cosine and a cosine. Here, I have a product of a sine and a cosine. So when I have these products, let's look at the first one. I have a product of cosine and cosine. I know that a product of cosine and cosine, I can write those as a cosine of sums and differences. So it's a little bit the same thing as here, but sort of backwards. So now I say I have a product of cosines, and that's like having the cosine of the, s the difference of these two arguments plus the cosine of the sum of these two arguments. Okay, that's cool. Uh, same thing with the sine, only now it's this, uh, um, I have to, uh, it's the same thing with sine, right? So I have one that's uh, f minus and one that's f plus. So now I'm going to go on and the next step is actually here I just repeated the integrals for you because I need a little bit more space to write my other equations. So now I have this cosine theta times and then now I have this uh, difference of frequencies, sum of frequencies, and these are cosines. Here's the sine of the difference and the sine of the sum. Uh, so now I'm going to take the integral. And the integral of a cosine is a sine. And the integral of a sine is a cosine. So I have very simple integrals that I evaluate. These are definite integrals. They're integrated over one bit uh, interval. So it's from 0 to t. So I have this cosine 1, and now it's multiplying the sines. Of course, I'm dividing by um, what was multiplying time here. So it's 2 pi, the, the frequency difference, and here it's 2 pi, the frequency sum. And this has to be evaluated between 0 and t. So the next thing I do is I just plug in the 0 and the t. So now I have a capital T here, which is the simple interval. And um, the zeros for the sine, the sine of 0, 0. And the cosine of 0 is 1. So for the ends of the integration, I get that. Following me so far, it's just it's a simple integral, integral of cosine, integral of sine. I evaluate it. And now let's take this result and see what we can do with it. Now the next thing is I'm going to notice that one is the denominator is these two frequencies, and it's the difference. The other one is the sum. Okay. These are carrier frequencies. So it's probably going to be up down, probably up in the, you know, kilohertz, megahertz, you know, these Fs are pretty large. And my goal is to keep them as close as I can. So this is going to be a very small difference. So even if these are in kilohertz, the difference could be in hertz. So my observation is that if I have, you know, a carrier frequency which is fairly large, larger than one, much larger than one, that these terms are going to be killed while these ones dominate because the difference I'm going to try and keep small and the sum is, is large. So these terms I can eliminate right away. So I neglect the terms in the sums of frequencies, and what's left is just the terms in the difference of frequencies. Okay, so that simplifies things a lot. So now I have a cosine theta, which is multiplying this term, and a sine theta, which is multiplying this term, which is a function of you know, the difference in the frequencies. And what I want to achieve is I want a condition on F1 and F2. How do I pick F1 and F2 so that this always gives me a zero? And it gives me a zero no matter what the theta is. So no matter what theta is, I want some condition on F1 and F2 that will force this to be zero. So how am I going to do that? So let's uh, write it up ag again uh, at the top. This is my goal. I want it to be equal to zero for all theta. Well, I have something that's multiplying cosine theta. So if it's true for all theta, then whatever is multiplying that cosine, it's got to be zero because I could have any value of, of there. Same thing here. Whatever is multiplying this, it's got to be equal to zero. So I have two conditions. I've got to have this equal to zero, and I've got to have this equal to zero. So in this case, if I want this, what's multiplying the sine theta here, if I want this term to go to zero, that means it's minus one. So this term has to go to one. So I want this cosine term here to go to one. And if I look at the other term here, what's multiplying the cosine theta, I want this sine to equal to zero. So I want one, the sine of this argument to equal to zero, the cosine of this argument to equal to one. Well, that's easy. That means that the argument has got to be a multiple of 2 pi. Because if the, this argument is a multiple of 2 pi, that means that its cosine will always be 1 and its sine will always uh, be 0. 
So the requirement is that this 2 pi t f1 minus ft equal some multiple of 2 pi. Now, I can get, cancel the 2 pi on both sides, and I get that the difference between these two frequencies has got to be a multiple of 1 over the, the sample time, uh, the symbol time t. So there's a certain bit rate I'm sending information at, a certain symbol rate I'm sending information at. t is the symbol time. And 1 over t is a frequency term. And that is the separation. It's got to be separated by multiples of this value. Now suppose we did the same analysis, but now we're doing coherent detection. With coherent detection, I've paid for a phase lock loop, and that theta goes to zero. So when the theta goes to zero, that means sine of theta is zero. That means one of these terms uh, just disappears. So this one is zero. So what's left, uh, I'm sorry, this sine theta is zero, which means this term, I no longer have a condition for, it's just zero. What I have a condition for is cosine of theta is one. So one times this, this term has got to be zero. So now I don't need the cosine and the sine to be cosine one, sine zero. Now I just need for the sine to be zero. So now instead of a multiple of two pi, it only has to be a multiple of pi. Multiple of pi means that now the frequency separation can be uh, a multiple of one over two t. So let's summarize these results. We found that for non-coherent detection, the separation had to be a multiple of one over t. Whereas for coherent detection, it had to be a multiple of 1 over 2t. So now I want the minimal separation. I want these to be as small, as, as close as possible. So now I'm going to choose n equal 1, because that will give me the minimal separation. So for non-coherent detection, the minimal separation is 1 over t. But for coherent detection, it's 1 over 2t. So the important thing is, first we've quantified for FSK, how tightly can we pack them? And we've also seen what is the, the cost of going from coherent to non-coherent. We saw the cost was 1 dB in terms of uh, the bit error rate versus the signal to noise ratio. But now in terms of spectral efficiency, we can see that the coherent is more spectrally efficient. We can pack them tighter than we could in the non-coherent case. So that was for Two, right? Uh, if I just take two symbols, I had F1 and F2, I know that these have to be separated by 1 over t for non-coherent detection. In this example, I'm assuming that in the time domain, I have rectangular pulses. If in the time domain I have rectangular pulses, That means that in the frequency domain, it has a sync function. So I've shown the sync function here. And this sync function has to be separated. The peaks here have to be, the central frequencies have to be separated by 1 over t in order for um, us to have orthogonality. And we can see you know, that it's the periodicity here that gives us the orthogonality. So, uh, this separation of 1 over t, if I were to switch to coherent, of course it could be tighter packed. So non-coherent has got to be farther apart, coherent they could be tighter. This is for binary. What happened if I wanted to look at multiple m -ary? Well in that case, uh, I could start stacking them one after the other and I could look at, you know, for, for m, how many would be occupied. And this would be the equation. Um, uh, I'm not sure that you can see that, divided by uh, m plus 3 divided by 2 over t would be the result for coherent detection. So the idea is that you could st stack them. Now here I made the choice of rectangular pulses, which gave to sync, uh, but that's not the only choice I have. So we'll be talking about that in the next, the next subject.